All right, if we could uh, go ahead and begin uh, the class. We are still in the section I have, let's see, we've talked about the, we've gone through the introduction. Oh yeah. Um, so as I said, Sunday, um, they, I put them up on the table Sunday. I was told that I was going through the uh, outline too fast and people couldn't write it down. Um, so I have printed them out. They're on the table in the back. If, uh, if you guys are interested, I've got the whole outline of the study uh, so we can keep up with where we are. You might be able to you know, print out a little arrow if you want and tape it as we go along. You don't have to do that. Um, chapters 1 through 35, um, uh, we're discussing the period of the uh, Assyrian conflict. And uh, the first, I believe it'll be chapters 1 through 12, uh, speak of prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And you'll hear about to see why I paused there. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue that, looking at 36 and through 39, the historical interlude. So Isaiah has a, a, a style change there. A, a sty his style in writing goes from poetic form to prose because he's giving an account of history. And then uh, in chapters 40 and beyond, we have it returning to poetry. Um, by the way, what are the two elements of poetry we discussed? Uh, Hebrew poetry, alliteration, and parallelism, right? Nice, nice. So uh, Blake, right? Blake got one right. So, so it, oh, there you go. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so it returns to poetic form here. Uh, both, uh, and we'll continue to see, and by the way, the memory verse, uh, Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, there are a lot of parallelisms uh, in that. Uh, we have, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills. There's parallelism within verse 2 itself. And we go to verse uh, 3, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So we have it established. We have people uh, saying, Let's go up to it. Uh, mountains, houses, the, we see the parallelism there. Um, but anyways, uh, we have it returning to a poetic form in chapters 40 through 66. And we've gone through the memory verse already. We'll go to our review questions. So those are review questions from last week. Let's go through them. Uh, in order of the reigns, uh, list the uh, four Judean kings in Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah. The one with the J. <laughs> Jotham, yep. Ahaz, Hezekiah. All right. Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. Which, uh, King Ahaz sought the help of Assyria against whom? The Babylonian. Uh, oh, why did I agree to that? No. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, one was very much in the wrong side. Um, that would be Ahaz, which King Ahaz sought the help of Assyria against Israel and Syria, which also known as Samaria and Damascus. And then uh, what archaeological find details the military successes and exploits, let me just not read it, I'll just say it. There is an archaeological find uh, of a Assyrian king that bragged about all his, everything he's done with his military. He's conquered this city, he's taken that city, he sacked this city, he's taking tribute from this city. He, he details all that. Sennacherib's prism. He says... 
I had Jerusalem shut up like a bird in a cage. And then he doesn't say anything else about it. Because we know from 2 Kings 19, they all died. They just woke up dead. Uh, 2 Kings 19, 35 through 36. So, uh, also known as Taylor's Prism. So, I'm hoping I've got... I'm sorry. I either didn't update my slides. Sennacherib, Sennacherib wasn't happy that Hezekiah decided that it, uh, Judah wasn't going to pay them tribute anymore. And he launched this uh, great military campaign against all the, the people rebelling against him. And uh, he was su very successful until he got to Jerusalem. So what word points to the source of Isaiah's, to the source of Isaiah's discourses? What word points to the source of his message? Vision. Yep. So that, that'd be in verse 1 1. We talked about that last week. Now, it wasn't Isaiah's opinions, it wasn't his ideas. Uh, all these things were given to him uh, in a vision. Though his ministry embraced Israel and the pagan nations, who were its primary focus? Judah and Jerusalem. We see that in uh, verse 1 as well. Um, the vision. Of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So, who is called upon to bear witness to God's indictment of Judah? We read it in verse 2. The heavens and the earth. Right. So, we, we talked about all that uh, last week. Any comments or questions so far? <clears throat> All right, so continuing our look at uh, sin and its maturity. Let me make sure I get where I need to be. So, when last we left, I wanted to talk about God's right to the obedience of the people and how that it's established um, in, on three grounds. And you see them above there. They are, first of all, His children. Second of all, they're nourished by him. And third of all, they were brought or exalted up by him. And let's, uh, let's go ahead. If somebody could please read verses 2 through 10 again. I know we did last week, but it won't, won't hurt to review it. Verses, uh, Isaiah 1, 2 through 10. Yes, sir. All right. Th uh, oh, yeah, go ahead.
All right, thank you, brother. So, God's right to obedience. First of all, first point here is they are His children. Uh, God is the author of their existence. Um, now, how often do we hear, you know, it might be in an award ceremony or something like that, where someone is accepting an award and they go through everybody that they're thanking and they'll say something like, you know, I would not be here today if it weren't for so-and-so. We hear about, we hear that, right? Uh, well, these people would not be there today without God. And we can say the same thing, can't we? Uh, in everything, in every sense of it. And so there are, there are multiple senses in which they are His children. Uh, first of all, mankind, mankind would not exist uh, without God's power. Uh, Psalm 139.14, um, which uh, a recognizable psalm uh, where we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, the psalmist says. Let me get the whole thing here. Um, Isaiah 139 and verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonder wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. So the psalmist is praising God. Why? Because the psalmist exists. The psalmist was made uh, by God. God made him. Can you imagine going through life just uh, thinking that you're owed more than you have? Um, thinking that you can live as you please? Thinking that... Um, you answer to nobody, you know, completely oblivious uh, to the fact that you are, you're not the center of the universe. Uh, and someone made you. You were created. And you could think about that in the, in the sense of, well, just, we could take it from the sense of uh, children even. Don't they sometimes act like, you know, they're just... Don't they forget that, they, that you, <laughs> you brought them into the world, so to speak? Um, they can be, and we could, we could see that as ingratitude. That's ingratitude, that's what that is. Um, but many people don't, re they walk through life without um, contemplating the fact that if they did not exist, uh, or they, if they, if it weren't for God, they wouldn't exist, is what I'm trying to say. So, um, Judah, Judah, all of mankind owes their existence to God's power. Judah, specifically, would not exist as a people without God's promise. Um, so, were the Israelites set aside by God because of their excellent character? No, <laughs> that, that deserved a laugh. No, they, they definitely were not set aside by God. And yeah, let's look at it. Let's look at Exodus uh, chapter 32. So here, here we've got a people that are set aside by God. And God would not agree with someone saying that they're set aside because of their special features. Uh, because uh, 32, Exodus 32, 1 through 10. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down off of the mount, um, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we will not, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a golden calf, a molten calf, excuse me. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And so they made these things and then credited them with having brought them out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat 
and to drink, and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So, God's essentially wanting to start from scratch. Um, he's, uh, the, the people have so quickly rebelled against Him, have uh, fashioned these idols, uh, credited these idols with having brought them out of Egypt. And God, there in, in verse 10, He's angry. And He, wants, he says, Moses, I'll, I'll make a great nation out of you. These people need to go. And of course, we know that Moses intercedes for them in the verses following. Say that to say this. Judah would not have existed without God's promise. Right? He, he told Abraham, I will uh, make of thee a great nation. Uh, and uh, he said that his seed would be as, uh, as, the, as, the sands of the, as the sands of the earth. So, we've got promises given to Abraham. He's, he's promised a seed to David. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And, uh, and now here we have Judah still in existence. And a part of that we're going to see is uh, due to a remnant there. Uh, but that to say this, Judah would not exist specifically without God's promise. They, were not, uh, they did not exist of their own goodness. Did you? Because they want to play in the road is what they want to do. It's, so they, our instruction, or uh, the parents' instruction to the children is for their own benefit. Uh, God's instruction for man was to their own benefit. And uh, all the dietary restrictions we read of, and we went through this with uh, Is the Bible God's Word, uh, all of that uh, was for the good of Israel. It, brought, it preserved that seed line uh, to the Christ. Yes, sir. When you just made that statement, I didn't have a peculiar, peculiar mental breakdown. We think that we are better than God to do what we want to do, and yet we can't even create another human being just like us. Right. <laughs> I didn't have a mental breakdown when I thought about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, his children rebelled against him. <laughs> and, yep. We can't control our own either. Um, so we wouldn't physically exist without God, and we wouldn't stand a chance without God either um, after having been brought into existence. So we're kind of like Judah. We, we wouldn't exist physically, and we wouldn't have the chance at eternal life like we do without His promise. So, these were His children, point, one, point number one. God's right 
to their obedience is, first of all, they're his children. Second of all, they're nourished by him. So he didn't just uh, create, um, it's referred to as the Jeffersonian God. I don't know if it's actually what Jefferson believed, but when they say Jeffersonian God, they're talking about uh, the belief that God just created man and left him alone, just uh, just uh, has no involvement with him whatsoever. Uh, but g- he didn't just create us and leave us to struggle on our own. He, we were never uh, left, first of all, to wonder about what our responsibilities to our Creator are and, and what kind of relationship uh, we can have with our Creator. Uh, we are nourished both physically and uh, spiritually by Him. So we know that it, uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 17 um, well, there, there was Psalm 1, uh, 139, Exodus 3.17, I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. He says, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. He, la- he brought them into a prosperous land where they were taken care of. Uh, in Numbers uh, 13.23 speaks of how prosperous and, and fertile that land was. So, owing to God's nourishment, uh, Israel would become a, a greater uh, nation. Let me just skip through here some. And uh, so what, what's God doing here? He's preserving a seed line uh, to the Messiah and the people of Israel, and by extension, the people of Judah, um, are benefiting from it. And the whole of mankind is benefiting from it by extension because uh, the, the Christ is brought uh, into the world. Third of all, they were brought up. That, and uh, looking at the, the language here, I uh, think the Hebrew, uh, we could just as well render this exalted. They were exalted. This nation was exalted by him. So uh, turn to Second Chronicles real quick. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 29. Chapter 20 and verse 29. Um, and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries uh, when they had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So, Israel didn't do that. God did that, right? Uh, they were brought to fear Israel. It wasn't for the, the might of the men that they feared them. Um, God had exalted Israel and, and Judah, uh, by extension, uh, to such a high status uh, from nothing. Uh, and the psalmist, going back to Psalm 113, psalmist found that praiseworthy. Uh, Somebody please read uh, Psalm 113 for me. Psalm 113. It's uh, nine verses. All right, thank you. So the psalmist sees this, um, the fact that God is able to take someone who is nothing by man's standards and make them great. Um, he, he did that with Israel and Judah. Uh, so Isaiah, what is he saying here? First of all, God is your father. You are his children. You owe him obe- obedience. Second of all, he has taken care of you. He's nourished you. He brought you into a land uh, 
and you sowed fields that you, or you reaped fields you didn't sow. Uh, you were nourished by him. And then finally, he brought them up. And th- repeatedly throughout history, uh, through the history of Israel, uh, lowly Israel is victorious against the nations around them. Um, like David and Goliath is, is the first that comes to mind. A, a lowly young man uh, takes out a giant. Um, and uh, the same is true with, with uh, the nations that the, they campaigned against in Canaan when, when they crossed over Jordan. So he brought them up. They, they owed him obedience. But that's not what God received from Judah. So we see this uh, condemnation of corruption in verses 2 through 9. Um, the ingratitude of the people is uh, communicated by Isaiah. Uh, they were the subject of his nourishment, yet they rebelled against him. Uh, there's a quote from Shakespeare's King Lear, uh, speaking of uh, the king being de- de- betrayed by his own daughters. He says, uh, Phileal gr- ingratitude, is it not as this mouth should tear his hands for lifting food to it. And that sounds to me like a fancy way of saying it, bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, uh, we, so we use that expression, we're familiar with that expression. Uh, he's nourished them, he's brought them up, and yet uh, they've bitten the hand that feeds them. Um, they seem to have no memory of uh, that nourishment or that exaltation. And so, uh, verse 3, by the way, did anybody wake up this morning without a roof over their head? No. Without a roof? Anybody wake up this morning without a roof over their head? No. Uh, Everybody get fed today? Do they have a meal? Um, So where do we get those things? We can say we got them, right? But really, we got them through the stewardship of the things that God has given us stewardship over. Um, we would be nowhere without God. Uh, and it, w- it would do well for us to be grateful to, uh, grateful to Him for that. But uh, Judah, in, in verse 3, The ox knoweth his owner, and the donkey his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. So you take these two animals here, um, and uh, the ox, for instance, both of them, and this is again parallelism, uh, it's taking these two, two animals, both beasts of burden, and neither of them, very, they're not very well known for their intelligence. Um, but they may not be intelligent, but they know where their food comes from, right? Uh, they know where to go to, uh, for provision. And uh, so Isaiah points out, look, the dumb ox and this dumb donkey know who their master is. And you have no idea who your master is. Uh, so what does that make you? Does it make you intelligent? Um, so I, I, I can't help but think about my dog because he knows who feeds him, Right? Sometimes Corey feeds him. <laughs> but uh, if, you take, if you take my dog, if you take Bucky to a dog park, uh, I find it interesting that I can whistle toward him and he knows my whistle. And he doesn't go to anybody else in that dog park. He comes to me, right? Or is, am I right? He does, doesn't he? <laughs> Corey's back there laughing. Um, but, uh, well, anyways, it's the same thing. The dumb animal knows who, who their master is, um, and the Judah did not know. Uh, the, our Lord used the example of sheep, uh, knowing the voice of the shepherd, uh, and, they, and he created a picture of um, his followers as sheep who know him, uh, and they won't be led astray by the voice of another uh, who comes in. And so, uh, as the sheep knows their shepherd, the ox and the donkey know where their master's crib is. Uh, 
Judah did not consider. Judah did not know. Um, and we want to accept our status as being higher than animals, um, but sometimes we don't know our own master, do we? Uh, we could, it could be as simple as not acknowledging his existence, uh, or it could be we just accept everything he's blessed us with and, and just take advantage of it and, and not think about serving him whatsoever. So uh, we too can, we can be in Judah's same spot. We see uh, that he's referenced as a seed of evildoers. Any, any comments or questions so far? Right, absolutely. So a seed of evildoers, uh, in, in verse two, uh, verse four, actually. So they are spreading sin here. What does seed do? It, when you spread seed, it grows. So these uh, the evildoer is is spreading sin like seed, and it's growing to maturity here. I think I have the course of sin. And the course of sin uh, begins, first of all, with a withdrawal from God. Um, one might not say, just as Judah probably didn't, uh, just come out and say, oh, I'm not going to have God to rule over me right away. Uh, rather, the first thing that happens is a, the affections for God, thoughts about God. Do you think about God? Do you think about Him daily? Uh, do you think about His Word daily? Um, If you're, if you're married, how would they feel if you stopped thinking about them for a day, right? What happens if you stop thinking about them for a day? Maybe, maybe another day passes and you don't really think about them. You grow apart, don't you? That's, that's what happens. And, and you can do the same with God. That's why we have to be constantly in His Word. Um, so, uh, so your thoughts, your affections, reaches full maturity is they are being uh, they're just corrupt people they are uh, rotten and taking advantage of of uh, the weak the poor and uh, let's see so what we're seeing here let's just look at verses five and six uh, their current state was a deterioration from a lack of maintenance. They, they have, had withdrawn their affection, uh, their thoughts from God. They were sinning. Uh, they were then deliberately disobeying Him. And uh, in, in verses 5 and 6, uh, From the sole of the foot, even the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, uh, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overgrown by strangers. Do you uh, imagine maybe, see I'm not the best about going to a doctor uh, right away when I need to. I haven't been to a doctor, have I, Coy, <laughs> since she's known me. Um, but, um, yeah, a while back I got, I, I ended up with a, acute bronchitis, and I could have gone to the doctor right away when I had issues, but it got so bad that I had trouble drinking a glass of water. 
I, I couldn't breathe so badly. But uh, could you imagine walking around with festering wounds, with sickness, and just refusing to go do anything about it, refusing to go to the doctor? That's uh, how Judah is pictured there in, in uh, verse, verse 6 there. So let's see here. I think I'm going to hold off on going further there. Uh, further from verse 6. Um, any comments or questions? All right. And the second bell rang anyways, didn't it? Okay, well, thank you all for your attention.